here because you guys will get involved and be able to do more stuff down here. Um, that's kind of interesting. Just a second. Ah, okay. Anyway, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our MC for the eighth annual COPD Education Day, Pedro Hara. And he is with the Tobacco Trust Fund Program Advisory Board, right? Or close enough. Anyway, um, and before we get started and before I introduce him, I want to remind everyone of basics. Um, we do have some exciting breaking news that we will be announcing today. And as a reminder, make sure before we start the drawing that you do hand in your yellow form that has at least 10 exhibitors that signed it. And parking, make sure you're parked in a legal space because we really don't want anyone towed. If you have questions about parking, you can ask at registration. Um, there are POB1 and POB2 and Miller Street will be validated and don't park in illegal spaces because they do tow. Um, there is um, bathrooms downstairs to the right. Um, the people at registration can help you with that as well. And make sure you fill out the, the pink form on both sides. You can fill out the background information and then the other side is for while we are speaking and you can evaluate so that we can have a better program next year. Um, and if people have questions about how to contribute, there is information in our program as well on that. Um, we are participants of the Give Aloha program for Foodland and we're also in Aloha United Way. So you can designate our organization for either or there is an envelope if you choose to contribute that way and we thank you very much for any donations. Um, and we are fortunate to have the voice of community theater, Pedro Hara. Thank you so much. Um, Valerie Chang is actually very humble. And she's the executive director for the COPD Coalition, which she helped build from the ground up. Um, I still remember uh, when I met her, it was several years ago at a Waimanalo Health Fair, and we had a big table. I was with the Department of Health back then, and we had a big table, and she had these little brochures that she was handing off on the side. She kind of was sitting next to us, and, and um, Lila Johnson from the Department of Health just said, oh, there's this, you know, this woman from the COPD Coalition. I'm not, you know, she's going to be coming with us, and, and that's when she taught me about uh, tobacco control. So at that time, I was with the Department of Health doing outreach for vulnerable populations. Um, and that's when I learned about that COPD is, uh, resp tobacco is responsible for about 80% plus of COPD cases nationwide. And since then, she has educated many, many people, brought in a lot of partners, built this coalition into the flourishing um, event that you see upstairs here, ongoing meetings. So, and now we have a little piece of the table on her big tables that she goes and displays at all of these community, at all of these community events. And she's just at ease um, at a legislative meeting as she is talking directly to patients. So I'd like to give a, a big warm applause to Valerie Chang who has put this day together. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us today. It's a really exciting agenda. Um, there are a lot of you who are not only suffering from COPD yourselves, but people who are working with that population, caregivers, people who are family members. And it's really exciting that you're all becoming involved in this. It's been uh, one of the issues in COPD. I still get a lot of people who say, what does that stand for? And what is it really? So it's really important for us to be here today. We have a really exciting agenda. So what we have today is we have, uh, to kick things off, we have Dr. Ronson Sato, who will give us a, uh, an overview of COPD and any current new advances. It's gonna be follow up. Valerie Chang is gonna come back up with Ralph Antonio to talk about as COPD patients themselves about getting more involved. It's going to be followed up by Bobby Tagawa and Bernie Soriano, who will lead us through some ways that you can stay physically active. And then to talk about, this is really important, about planning and resources, and you know, particularly as um, with an aging population, we're going to have Gary Powell. And then finally, we're going to have Patricia Tom, who will explain to us how to get medical help in your own home. 
So let's get started. So first of all, we have our first speaker is Dr. Ronson Sato. He's a Pearl City boy. Uh, Dr. Sato completed his internal medicine residency at the University of Hawaii in 2008 and subsequently completed a three-year fellowship in pulmonary and critical medicine at UC Irvine. He then completed a postgraduate fellowship at Stanford in sleep medicine. Dr. Sato is in private practice at the Queens Medical Center and Kuakini Physician's Office Building. He also serves as the program chair for today's event and will be providing us an introduction to COPD and the latest update and medications available. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Sato. Thank you, Pedro, and good morning, and thanks for everyone, uh, to everyone for coming. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about COPD, uh, how we diagnose it, how we manage it, um, and my goal is to give you uh, a basic understanding and an appreciation for COPD, so that can help you to help manage yourselves and hopefully uh, help to educate others as well. So why are we here? We're here because COPD is important. Uh, it's a common disease and affects more than 5% of the population in the US. It also kills more than 120,000 people per year and is the third leading cause of death in the US. Uh, so it's important that we diagnose and manage people because by doing so, we can help improve symptoms, reduce exacerbations, it improves health status, uh, improves exercise capacity, and also improves survival. So what is COPD? It stands for a chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease and is characterized by usually progressive airflow limitation due to an enhanced chronic inflammatory response in the body. Now, one of the, the big things to remember is that it's preventable and treatable. So what this image shows here is on the left, a normal looking airway versus a person with COPD on the right. <clears throat> and what I want you to, what it tries to illustrate is that in a normal airway, you have cells which line the inner airway wall, which secrete mucus to help lubricate the airway, and is also encircled by smooth muscle, and that can constrict to help protect the airway. These airways terminate in small sacs called alveoli, and that's where uh, gas exchange occurs, the exhalation and uh, exit of carbon dioxide and where oxygen enters. Now, in a person with COPD, uh, the airways are in a state of chronic inflammation. So the cells here that produce mucus are at an increased amount. So you have more mucus production. And the smooth muscles also are constricted and tight so that it narrows the airway, inner airway space. That, together, contributes to more airway obstruction with inhalation of irritants, either environmental, occupational, tobacco, uh, that can lead to airway wall destruction and further airway collapse. And the more you inhale these chronic, uh, these irritants and cause inflammation, that has a higher risk of leading to lung scarring. So this is, I wanted to depict a more three-dimensional image of, in this case on the right side, a normal airway. So here you have a big open inner airway space, so um, unrestricted airflow, compared to an airway that's inflamed. So you got smooth muscle contraction, narrowing the inner airway space, cells which are producing more secretion, more mucus, which further obstructs the airway, uh, which can contribute to the symptoms that people with COPD have. Now COPD is actually uh, encompasses a group of different lung diseases. That includes emphysema, asthma, and chronic bronchitis. And they, what they all have in common is this state of chronic inflammation that contributes to the symptoms and the, the physiology that we see. Now again, looking back at that airway in a normal, healthy individual, you have these airways that lead, that terminate into alveoli, which are the sacs, again, that exchange gas. Um, and compared to somebody with COPD, Airways are inflamed, 
you have increase in those number of cells that produce secretions. So you have increased mucus production, a lot of smooth muscle tightness, constriction, which narrows the airway. <clears throat> and in terms, or in cases where you have this chronic state of inflammation, this can also lead to damage of those alveolar sacs. So you see a lot of destruction of the airway walls and that leads to non-functional airways. When a person comes in and we are concerned about COPD, um, the assessment, initial assessment includes, you know, a very detailed history taking, symptoms, uh, family history, COPD, other lung diseases, and doing a physical examination. Uh, patients are usually on the older side, older than, uh, older than 40, but again, that depends on their susceptibility to those occupational environmental hazards and how much they're exposed to those things. Uh, and on exam, oftentimes the, the lung exam, which you think would be where the money is, is pretty normal. Sometimes you can hear some wheezing, some crackles. Um, a chest might be hyperinflated, what we call barrel chested. Um, but, you know, that's uh, different things to kind of key into. Uh, risk of exacerbation. So we're looking for risk factors that might contribute to COPD or other kinds of lung diseases or other disorders as well. Associated comorbidities. These are medical conditions that are associated with COPD, like cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, uh, mood disorders, depression and anxiety, and lung cancer. We also have the benefit of using diagnostic studies to help to differentiate between these different lung diseases and other disorders as well. Um, spirometry, which are lung function tests, imaging tests like x-rays, CT scans, and blood tests. So the most common symptoms of COPD, number one, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, especially with activity or increased exertion, chronic cough and increased mucus production. Uh, less common are things like wheezing um, and depending on if you have associated uh, illnesses like an infection, you can have fever, uh, but very uh, much less common. Risk factors, well, number one, cigarette smoking. I think Pedro already mentioned, um, you know, COPD is associated or 80% of the people with COPD have either smoked or are current smokers. Uh, but there's other things that can lead to uh, COPD, exposures to organic and inorganic dust, fumes, chemicals, and these are particularly biomass fuels. These are biologic materials. Um, and in the end, uh, outdoor air pollution actually contributes relatively uh, a small amount to that kind of risk. So some of the diagnostic studies and the tests you may have already heard about or performed, uh, the mainstay is pulmonary function tests or breathing tests that we do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. Blood tests and in particular alpha-1 antitrypsin. This is a protein that helps to protect the lungs and when it's deficient that can lead to uh, airway destruction. And blood tests looking for other disorders as well, separating um, lung disorders from cardiovascular disorders, looking, uh, you know, ruling out uh, CHF or other disorders as well. An oxygen assessment, you know, assessing how well the lungs get oxygen from the air you're breathing into the bloodstream, and then imaging tests. So pulmonary function tests, um, and in particular spirometry, can range from an extensive, uh, complete form where you're in a booth, uh, and you have a tube in your mouth that's really accurately, as, as best as pos possible, trying to monitor the amount of lung volume in and out uh, to a more convenient type, the handheld spirometers that some of you may have done in your doctor's office. Uh, that's usually pretty, uh, at least adequate, to diagnose and assess the overall severity of airflow obstruction. So the GOLD system is a system that categorizes patients with COPD based on the severity of airflow limitation. It's also used to assess uh, response to medications and can be used to monitor disease progression. Imaging test, uh, the most common one that we use, chest x-ray. Again, this is an x-ray on the left of a, a normal chest. Um, and just so you get a basic understanding, you guys are going to be experts in reading films as well. The x-ray helps to differentiate between different organ systems based on density of tissue. 
So the most dense tissue appears white on an x-ray. So that would be the bones, spinal column, the ribs, the chest wall, and fluid-filled organs like the heart, abdomen. And com in comparison to the least dense kind of material, which is air in the lungs. So the lungs, which are supposed to be filled with air, are primarily black. So you can see the dense tissues, especially with the lungs, because of the background of air-filled lung. So it helps to really stand out to see what the, the lungs look like. So this would be a normal lung and a normal chest x-ray compared to a chest x-ray with COPD. And I think the biggest difference you can see is that the x-ray on the right shows lungs that are really elongated, really extended, and we call that hyperinflation. And that's a common finding in patients with COPD because that there's a difficulty getting airflow out because of that collapsibility of the airways. When you try to force air out, it actually collapses the, the airways and lung gets, or air gets trapped, causing this increasing lung volume. And you have more difficulty getting it out, more difficulty getting air out. And that leads to hyperinflation. CT scan. Now, the CT scans are a little bit different. Uh, but have a similar concept. It's a three-dimensional, cross-sectional cut of the organ system that you're evaluating. The most dense tissue, again, appears white, and that's going to be your spinal column. So this is the back, and this is a cross-section of the chest, the heart, chest wall. And all this kind of grainy gray tissue is air-filled lung. Now, you can see th this is probably somebody with mild or kind of early stages COPD. So you have these pockets here which are really black and again black is least dense so this is air and these are areas where you have pockets where there's no functioning lung tissue and it's illustrated here by these arrows and so those are areas where no lung tissue they've been destroyed versus the CT scan on the right which shows a lot more advanced destruction and these are like blisters if you can imagine in the lung tissue where there used to be functional lung tissue, but now are just big cavities that don't work. So moving on to treatment. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of these treatments are, are things that have been in place for a while. Number one, smoking cessation. We'd mentioned how much smoking contributes to COPD overall. And it's something that's doable. That's something that people are doing to themselves that if you can cut down or quit, it has huge benefits on health. Oxygen, oxygen therapy, which improves symptoms, quality of life, can, and can also improve survival. Medications, and that includes inhalers. Uh, the two major classes are your uh, smooth muscle relaxants that help to open up the airways and anti-inflammatory inhalers. Mucolytics are medicines that help to break down mucus so it's not as thick and tacky. And steroids also, this is oral or IV steroids, and you really have to suppress that inflammation. Vaccinations. Vaccinations are important because people with COPD don't do well when they get flus or pneumonias. And getting a flu vaccination can uh, decrease your risk of getting flu by 76%. So it's really important. I always stress uh, my patients to get the flu vaccination when it's available. Antibiotics when it's appropriate. Physical activity, pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, this also helps dramatically to improve symptoms, exercise capacity, and also has been shown to improve survival. Surgery, and this can range from lung resection surgery uh, to transplant. Now, lung resection surgery uh, really focuses on trying to remove those pockets of non-functioning lung that you saw in that CT scan and really focus on leaving normal functioning lung. And by doing that, that reduces the wasted resources of the body to uh, keep those uh, non-functional areas going. So it really tries to focus on um, directing your resources, the circulation, oxygen to functional lung. And nutrition. Nutrition is something that I think we often overlook, uh, but is really important in people with malnutrition. Lung muscles don't work well, and so that can contribute to worsening symptoms and actually has a higher risk of mortality with uh, malnutrition. So going back to that number one, what we can do is, number one is quitting smoking or trying to at least cut down, because it has huge benefits in lowering risks for not only lung disease, but other things as well. So heart disease is a big one. 
and cancer and numerous cancers, not just lung cancer, but head and neck, colorectal, liver, kidney, pancreas, stomach, lower urinary tract uh, cancers, penile cancers, and uterine cancer. Another, and other tobacco-related diseases uh, are also improved. Infections, that includes TB, pneumonia, influenza, a common cold, diabetes, osteoporosis, peptic ulcer disease, reproductive disorders like spontaneous abortions, infertility, um, low birth weight, and periodontal disease. So huge benefits overall, just with health status overall when you can cut down or quit smoking. Uh, this is a graph that was kind of coming up on the slideshow earlier, and this shows lung function uh, over time, okay? And everybody after the age of 25 or so, you start to have a standard decline in the rate of lung function that we have. And that's represented here by this upper curve and a little blue for, to uh, allow for a little variability. But these are people who never smoked. Okay, and you have a slow, steady rate of decline over time. But in people who smoked, you have a rate of decline that's about five to eight times faster than that normal rate. And you can see as that lung function declines, you start to hit these thresholds where you have onset of symptoms, dis uh, disability, and then eventual death. Uh, but the good thing, the, the take home on this is that yes, People who smoke, they have a much faster rate of decline in lung function. But if you stop, that rate of decline actually returns to normal. And so it parallels that level, that standard level that if you had never smoked. But unfortunately, there, if there is some degree of lung damage that's been done, that could be irreversible. So you never quite get back up to where you would have been if you never smoked. But you can see that the decline returns to normal. And so it's huge, huge benefits of quitting smoking. And of course, the earlier, the better. You know? so we're gonna talk about some of the uh, medications that are classically used to treat COPD. Uh, the most common one, number one, is bronchodilators. Uh, these are smooth airway muscle relaxants. Again, trying to relax that smooth muscle that's constricting the airway, so allowing for more airflow. Uh, they're long-acting um, and now more convenient. Typically, or the standard, the conventional inhalers are usually used twice a day. They're effective in helping reduce exacerbations, hospitalizations, uh, improving symptoms and lung function, and they can be used in combination with different classes. Different medications trying to accomplish the same thing but in different ways. Corticosteroids, which are medicines that help to reduce that inflammation. These are medicines uh, particularly indicated for people with more severe or very severe uh, lung or airflow limitation. But they also improve symptoms, lung function, quality of life, and help to reduce exacerbations. And these can be used in combination with those long-acting smooth muscle relaxants. So what's new? So we're gonna talk about uh, the new gold guidelines new medications, a new attitude, what people can do for themselves and for others. So one of the criticisms from the previous uh, system that categorized severity of COPD was that it only looked at one component um, in the total picture. It only looked at lung function. Now in this new system, we try to categorize people based on risk of recurrent exacerbations, and that's based on frequency and severity of symptoms, um, again, still including in lung function and history of exacerbations. And that helps to try to stratify and work as a guide to how to best manage these patients. Uh, new medications. There are always new medications uh, coming out. I think these newer ones are centered at trying to improve compliance and, of course, effectiveness. Uh, these inhalers, you might have heard, are meant to work faster, to be more convenient for people so that it's usually one time a day dosing rather than two puffs um, and can be used in combination with other medicines. And there is some data suggesting um, that combination therapy is better than uh, single uh, therapy, especially depending on the severity 
of your of COPD. So not a lot of new medications trying to put together a smooth muscle relaxants and anti-inflammatories, and now inhalers that even include two different type of smooth muscle relaxants. And again, trying to focus on convenience for the patient to improve compliance. So one, once a day dosing if possible, and even triple therapy, three different medications rather than just two, and which has shown to improve lung function, which can then hopefully translate to better symptoms, better exercise capacity, quality of life. Uh, Ruflimilas or Dalaresp, it's a pretty unique medication and also, but still works as an anti-inflammatory for patients with severe COPD and chronic bronchitis. And this can be used in combination with other inhalers um, to prevent exacerbations. And I wanted to talk a, a little bit about e-cigarettes because it's been so, on such a, a rise in the last several years. And I get a lot of patients that ask me about you know, the benefits of e-cigarettes, is it harmful? Um, so just a little bit about that. Uh, it, they're battery operated. They work um, when heated. Liquid nicotine in, that's held in a cartridge turns into vapor and is inhaled. That liquid nicotine is highly toxic and can be inhaled or absorbed through the skin. And it's nicotine, so it's still highly addictive. But honestly, the health risks are still relatively unknown. Um, and I think the big part of it, the big problem is that a lot of these devices are unregulated. So there's no standardization about how much nicotine is going into that, that liquid or what chemicals are involved or the handling. And so it's very, um, I guess, unknown as far as trying to standardize what, what would work, what benefits there are, and you know, what the risks are. Uh, CD, CDC reported in 2011 to 2012, uh, high school use had doubled from 4.7 to 10 percent, and which also was associated with increased poison control calls, uh, 51 percent of which involved children. And <clears throat> to argue potential benefits of e-cigarettes, uh, there have been studies that suggest secondhand e-cigarette smoke may be less harmful than conventional cigarette smoke. Uh, there's about 10 times less carcinogenic chemicals, uh, that includes lead, but they also found that e-cigarette secondhand smoke had increased levels of nickel and chromium, uh, titanium, uh, all of which are not found in conventional uh, cigarette smoke. And the thought is that this, uh, these different metals are coming from the casings of the cartridges that are, that are being heated up. So. <clears throat> Again, still a lot that's unknown. You can see that um, they're made to look pretty cool. I mean, they look like cigarettes, cigars, pipes, pens, um, USB memory sticks. They come in different sizes. The nicotine liquid comes in different flavors. And so, again, the, the biggest problem, I think, is the, the dysregulation. It's not standardized. Uh, you don't know what's going into that, that fluid, the liquid, how much nicotine's in there, other chemicals. And the concern is that it could be a gateway to other tobacco products as well. So recently, um, the FDA published proposed regulations on e-cigarette use, uh, that people be at least 18 years of age, and this can be variable by state, and that um, could be higher. Uh, all new products are registered with and reviewed by the FDA that none of these products are distributed in vending machines and no free samples are distributed, that they require health warnings uh, listing the potential addiction to tobacco, and that they must provide scientific evidence before making claims of direct or indirect benefit. But in terms of you know, the current status, it's um, primarily dependent on the person taking that risk if you're going to use these kinds of um, products. A new attitude, maybe the most important part of taking control uh, and helping yourself is to take charge. Um, now with smartphones, iPhones, and iPads, the internet, there's so much more access to information. And so oftentimes people know what to do, but don't do what they know. Uh, so, you know, I really stress that a lot of times it's just a matter of doing it, executing what you know uh, can help uh, there's a push again for combination therapy using more than just one medication to optimize your symptoms, 
reducing exacerbations, improving lung function. Uh, physical activity is almost always better in any kind of disorder. Um, you know, pulmonary rehabilitation, being as active as possible, physical therapy, whatever it is, usually always does better than just being sedentary. And that's not just with lung disease, but other diseases um, and illnesses as well. And then work following up with your physician to work together to really optimize and, you know, create a plan to help manage yourself. Okay, and that's it. Any questions? Okay, okay. So I think we'll have some time for questions uh, at the end. All right, thank you. What a great presentation. Um, Dr. Cynthia Goto and myself are part of the Hawaii Tobacco Prevention and Control Trust Fund project team. One of the projects that we oversee is the Hawaii Tobacco Quit Line. Um, has anybody heard of the Hawaii Tobacco Quit Line? Okay, good. What's the number? Quit now. 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Okay, good. We're doing a good job with our marketing. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a great takeaway. Um, from Dr. Sato's uh, presentation is that it's preventable and it's treatable. And that one of the number one things that somebody can do is to quit tobacco use. Uh, we're all sort of handling that issue with e-cigarettes and trying to figure out what's best. And I think that that's a really great message, the buyer beware. You know, if it's too good to be true, you know, you have to be, you have to be concerned about it. Um, we also have... Uh, American Lung Association up at the top, um, Debbie Apollo, who is a face-to-face -face cessation counselor, who would be really great. If you're here, go ahead and take a, um, talk, you can talk to her and she can set up some um, appointments with you if, if you prefer a face-to-face. -face. Or if you have 1-800-QUIT-NOW um, uh, is a phone service or a web service that you can access online. So that's hawaiiquitline.org or see Debbie upstairs. And if you're any, um, if you're with a healthcare organization and want to, you know, talk about how we can partner up, we'll be happy to talk to you about that as well. Great. Thank you so much again, Dr. Sato. Okay, we have two next speakers. So what's really important and what we always hear is people want to hear from other people who have gone through, through the same experiences as, as them. And that's what we're going to have on our next two speakers. To help us figure out how to become more involved, we have two great individuals who can tell us firsthand how to do that because they have gone through it themselves. Both of our next speakers are COPD patients themselves. Uh, and for the first time, we have Ralph Antonio, a COPD patient, a golfer, and a small business owner. And with him, we have Valerie Chang, who is also a COPD patient and a retired judge and the executive director and co-founder for Hawaii COPD Coalition. They'll be talking about being active and advocacy with COPD. Let's give them a warm welcome. Hello, I'm Ralph and I have COPD. My lung capacity is 44%. Make it go back. Go back. I don't know how to make it go back. Oh, I can go back. Oh, well. Oh, I know. Oh, wrong way. Wrong way, sorry. Okay, never mind. We'll just turn it off. Okay, sorry about this. I Technical broke it. Difficulties. No, go ahead. I broke it. <laughs> okay. Oh, shoot. Can someone pick up the phone and tell them to put it back on the slide with Ralph? There's a phone. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Go ahead. Hello again. I'm Ralph and I have COPD. My lungs capacity is 44% and it's severe. <clears throat> At 
at times I wonder if it's 44 or 50, but it just depends on what time of the day it is. Uh, usually in the morning, I'm okay. When it comes uh, lunchtime, well, I kind of wore myself out simply because I don't use that much oxygen. I just use it at night. And uh, <clears throat> I try that uh, method only because I just love to golf. I need to practice. And I said, well, not practice hit balls, but need to uh, go through the motions. And uh, I do pretty well, but uh, I suppose that my age is catching up, and I, I blame it all on old age. Anyway, uh, some of the effects that is troublesome to COPD, and this is my own terms, and it's my own opinion, uh, is uh, warm weather raises my body temperature up so high that it actually stops me in my tracks. I'd have to find uh, the nearest shade to feel comfortable or just feel like I'm normal, but it takes a while to come down. Another thing is, and this is my own terms, claustrophobic um, atmosphere. I'll explain that later, but uh, I run into that a lot. But basically, it comes down to uh, in a parking garage where there's a lot of fumes. I was waiting for an elevator to come up and get me, and it took so long that all of a sudden I was gasping for air. I said, oh my word, I said, this can't be real. I'm, I, I'm just standing here. But it happened where the fumes in the garage does affect me. So I just said, well, I'll just drive to the top and get off at the top and get the elevator from there. At least there's some fresh air up there. Not much, but there is. Okay, um, <clears throat> I have been a licensed contractor since 1982. A lot of people have not heard of me because what I've done was I bid on a project. If I'm successful, then I choose whether to work with that person or not. Uh, the reason being that uh, I'm a small guy and um, my funding was, uh, I guess, so small that uh, I had to be careful what jobs I was involved with. I employed as many as 30 people, most of them in the union, and payroll gets pretty hard, so yeah, it was too much stress for me. And at the time, I didn't know I had COPD. I, I just overlooked uh, the sickness or the, the health that I was in and just continued from 1982 to finally this year. So uh, <clears throat> I've finally uh, been retired for two years, but I gave up my license uh, September 1st. Um, I'm a trained expert in the steel industry, welding. I had uh, <clears throat> put up structures, steel structures, and buildings with a great number of uh, general contractors that you know of. And uh, uh, a lot of my jobs took me between one year and four years to complete. So since 1982, I didn't have that many work to speak of. But my latest uh, project was, I'm the one that extended the uh, Maui International Airport. Uh, if you know the cruise ship terminal, I'm the guy that put all of those together. And I did quite a bit of jobs in Pearl Harbor and uh, the Honolulu International Airport. So uh, my job in the welding contributed to my demise, simply because 
the, uh, <clears throat> the chemicals that I was working with was welded and painted and uh, galvanized material was putting out fumes that wasn't as uh, critical at that time. We found out later it was critical. Uh, <clears throat> all of our work that we did in, I guess, uh, rooms that had no, no good ventilation, that affected us. Anyway, um, recently I had started reading books, being active. I average about two pocket books a month, and I've been doing that all year long. Um, and I love to golf. Uh, I'm not a single handicapper, but I'm close. At, uh, I shouldn't be uh, bragging any, but uh, <clears throat> I've been golfing since the early 60s, and I haven't stopped since. The ball don't go as far, but uh, I'm, I'm happy. I never got a hole in one, but I've had quite a few eagles. And uh, I sure like to see that par three and get one in there somehow. But uh, maybe one day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, now let's see if we can make this work. How do I? Okay, now it's staying there for good. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm here to talk about advocacy. And in terms of advocacy, we can also try more and do more. This is a picture of us recently with Maisie, Senator Maisie Hirono. That's me, Maisie. Uh, Tiffany Gurley with the Department the Tobacco, no, Tobacco Pro Coalition for Tobacco Free Hawaii and Lila Johnson with the State Department of Health Tobacco Prevention and Education Program and the American Cancer Society. We went to talk to uh, Senator Hirono about lung health issues because um, she, Senator Hirono has joined the US COPD caucus and she is one of our, our strongest advocates of lung health and we want to keep her informed about the latest issues. Um, and if anyone wants to go visit Senator Hirono or any of our electeds, let us know and we'll, I'll be happy to work with you and come if you'd like. And I don't understand how this, oh, there we go. Okay, so there's two kinds of advocacy. There's the personal advocacy, advocating for your own health, like Ralph and I do, and all of you probably do when you go see your doctor and your healthcare team. And there's also advocacy on behalf of the larger group, like when we go see our legislators or other people and we're working on behalf of ourselves and our loved ones and other people that are similarly situated. So we're gonna talk about both of these types of advocacy. Um, and one of the reasons we do this is because of this funding chart. On the, in the blue, it shows how many deaths there are of each of these, from all of these different conditions. And in the red, it shows how much funding there is for each of the different conditions. Um, as you can see, there's a great disparity. COPD kills one person every four minutes, but it is much underfunded compared to a lot of other health conditions. And that's one of the things we have to keep raising every time we talk to people that have any power to make any difference on this. And it is also on our website. Um, to do personal advocacy so that we can stay as healthy as we can and go to the golf course, um, 
We need to work with our partners like Dr. Sato, the respiratory therapists, um, and all the other people on our team, including the pharmacists. That's why we have the people that are here for this um, event. We do have pharmacists because they are an invaluable team member. They can help you go over your medications. They can help you with inhalation technique and they can help make sure that you don't have medicines that conflict with each other. They've, they've done quite a few studies that have shown that more than half of the people do not take their inhalers properly. And so you're actually not getting the full effect and benefit from your medicines. So if you haven't had a chance today yet to go upstairs and talk to the pharmacy students and the respiratory therapists and the respiratory therapy students, please do, because we want to make sure that everybody is getting 100% of the benefit of their medicines. Um, my doctor, when I was first diagnosed, explained to me that as a patient, because everyone is so stressed with so many competing, um, everybody is pushing and pulling at the doctors and the respiratory therapists and everyone else, uh, it is up to us individually each to become our own quarterback. We can get as much information as we need, and we have the best vested interest in our personal health. So we have to be reporters. We have to, that's why we had um, booklets upstairs that are still available for us to keep track of our symptoms. We can tell when we're getting better, when we're getting worse. If we don't tell our doctor, they're assuming everything is going fine. They can't, the psychic, the psychic um, meld does only works in Star Trek. Dr. Sato and all of his colleagues can only do what we tell them. If, if we don't tell them, you know, this medicine, I've been taking it regularly, it's making my heart race. Or this medicine doesn't seem to work as well as the other medicine you used to have me on. We have to give them that kind of feedback because otherwise we're assuming they know it's not working. They're assuming it's fine. So if we don't communicate, it's our fault. Okay, so that's part of being the quarterback. And the other part of being the quarterback is working to get a written action plan. We have forms upstairs for that as well. And we really think it's an important thing for you to go over with your medical team and update it periodically because our conditions change. I was diagnosed in 2000 and they told me I needed a lung transplant any day. Now they tell me I'm way too healthy. So I'm like, yes. It's good to lose some of these things. <laughs> um, we have breathing hui meetings. We welcome people to attend them. They're once a month at two locations, Kaiser and Honolulu on Pensacola. And um, we also have one at Palimomi. And um, we will try to expand locations if we have the need but we want to have enough people come so that we have an opportunity to share. We do have guest speakers, including physicians, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, and they are led by myself and uh, respiratory therapist um, Joanne Ikihara. Um, these are the schedules, and it's also online. If you have access to the computer and go to hawaiicopd.org, it has a calendar of events every month. Um, and these are the, some of the major respiratory issues currently facing our nation and our state. Competitive bidding is the process by which Medicare and Medicaid is attempting to reduce the cost of providing health care. So one of the first things they're cutting is reimbursement for oxygen, which is why we brought the durable medical equipment provider upstairs so that people can see the different forms of oxygen that are available and try to find out a little more about them. Um, and one of the problems is because they are cutting the reimbursement so much and they make everyone bid, our state used to have over 100 providers and now we have about 10 or 12. So it's a real problem. On the, other, on the neighbor islands, I believe there is only one provider left that's providing um, all forms of durable medical equipment, and, and that's for Maui and Kauai, and it's, it's becoming a growing problem. Um, 
So we're trying to work with our electeds about that issue. And um, we're asking that locally that there be a Hawaii presence when there is a durable medical equipment provider because right now, several of the people that have won the contracts only have employees in Texas or Florida or wherever they're based. And it's a real problem if you need uh, repair to your equipment that's in Honolulu and their nearest person is in Texas or Florida. And you're like, um, when are you gonna get that part to us? And they're like, well, yeah, well, we'll get to it when we get to it. And you're like, that's not gonna work so well. Anyway, so we're working on that. Um, we're also trying to make sure that respiratory therapists can get reimbursed. Right now, people that um, consult on diabetes can get re reimbursed, but respiratory therapists cannot be reimbursed as a special, you know, like, uh, like you can reimburse for tobacco counseling, but you can't reimburse for respiratory therapists working one-on-one -on -one with us so that we m understand how to use everything, including the oxygen, as well as possible. So we're trying to work on that. Um, and we're also working with the uh, various partners so that people have clarity and consistent rules about cigars and electronic smoking devices, which Dr. Sato touched on. Um, let's see. And we do need your stories and your help. And if you contact me either by email or by phone or come to our support group meetings, we can actually be more effective than if it's just one of us shouting in the dark. Um, and these issues keep coming up because we really need to work together with our national partners to try to make some changes. Um, we are working with our Hawaii State Strategic Plan on COPD as well. And there again, we have the funding graph. Um, and it surprises a lot of people that there are over 46,000 Hawaii adults that have been diagnosed and likely an equal number that have not yet been diagnosed. And it does cost our state almost $56 million every year for ER and hospital visits. Um, there is an exciting new thing, which is COPD gene, and it is a research study that is funded by the National Institutes of Health. It involves 10,000 people, and it's by Dr. Ed Silverman and um, the National Jewish. Dr. Silverman is at uh, Brigham Women's and Children's, which is the medical school for Harvard, and this is the video of it. We hope it will run. Okay. Hi, Michael. Um, can we run the video? Anyway, this video is available on YouTube if you look up COPD gene, um, and it is by Dr. Ed Silverman. <laughs> it's possessed. Anyway, um, and also on the COPD Foundation, oh, he's doing it. The COPD Foundation website, you can sign up if you want to be contacted about possibly participating in uh, COPD research. COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. It's a syndrome that includes emphysema, where the lung is destroyed and replaced by holes. It includes chronic bronchitis, where people have chronic cough and sputum production. And it includes small airway disease, where the small bronchial tubes get narrowed and damaged. So different COPD patients have different combinations of those three things, but they uh, cause airflow obstruction. It makes it hard for them to blow the air out hard and fast, which makes them uh, short of breath and, and, and leads to a variety of other health problems. And it's a, it's a major cause of death. It's the third leading cause of death in the U.S. Major cause of, uh, of uh, loss of time from work, of disability, uh, and, and other health care costs. COPD gene is a study of more than 10,000 volunteers who are getting careful uh, genetic assessment using state-of-the-art methods, state-of-the-art state imaging with CAT scans, and then a variety of other clinical tests like questionnaires and, and, and breathing tests so that we can try to understand why some people get COPD and others don't.
I think this is really the, the largest sample of, of COPD subjects that have ever been well characterized, uh, certainly for a genetic study ever assembled, and that this really has been built as a national and international resource with all the data being deposited into um, NIH repositories so that people can get access to it. Volunteers were incredibly helpful. I mean, th th this research would not have been possible without the, the in incredible support from uh, the, the general population. And, and 10,000 people to be recruited over a three-year period was a huge effort. Uh, Two-thirds of the people were, um, were not Hispanic white and one-third were African-American. Um, we had a close partnership with the COPD Foundation. It's a, a patient-run uh, organization that really helped us launch the COPD gene study. It provided support to help us get recruitment for the study, and uh, really every step of the way has been a, a, a critical ally for, for our work. So I, I think that, um, that there, there's just uh, no way of, uh, of, of, of overemphasizing the importance of, of, of volunteerism for this work. If we hadn't um, had you know, enthusiastic support from our volunteers who you know, gave them their own time to come in, uh, get a CAT scan, go through an extensive array of tests with breathing tests and walk tests and a long list of questionnaires. Uh, if, if they hadn't been willing to do that, we, we, we just couldn't do the work. So I, I think that people need to understand that medical research isn't something that, that happens out there by other people. If, if, they want, if they want new medical discoveries, they should really consider getting involved. They, they should consider being part of clinical trials, consider being, being part of these observational uh, epidemiologic and genetic studies, because that's the only way we'll really learn things and we'll uh, advance medical knowledge. Okay, so this is the website. It's on your, in, in your programs. I have registered and I encourage anybody that is possibly interested. There's no obligation if you register. It just allows you to be contacted in case they have a research study, then you can talk with your doctor about whether it's appropriate for you. The thing is, if they have a lot of people registered, it tends to make it a lot easier and less expensive for the researchers that want to do research. One of the big expenses for research is finding patients that are suitable for your study. If they have the registry, like they did for COPD gene, of 20,000 or 40,000 or 50, 100,000 people that are interested in doing research, it really cuts the costs and makes them more encouraged to fund research for whatever your condition is. Um, I did ask them if I could participate in COPD gene. They said, no, we don't have enough Asian Americans, so we're not gonna do it. We're gonna do Africans and whites. And I'm like, okay. But that's why they said build a database and we'll see if we can do some Hawaii searches and some Hawaii research. So we're hoping that people will consider. There's no obligation. You can tell them no, you can tell them that's not really what I'm interested in, or my doctor says it's not appropriate, and that's all fine. But it is confidential, and it is um, very worthwhile. I have participated in several research studies, um, and I encourage you to consider it. Um, I am also active with the US COPD Coalition. I am uh, the secretary for the National uh, COPD, US COPD Coalition, and it's a, really good organization that helps people work together about this national issue. And there we go. Thank you so much. Great job with the ghost presenter, Valerie. Um, and th thank you very much. I, it's very important to be able to hear from people who are going through the issues themselves. And a lot of you that are working to work with um, people with COPD, um, you know, and working in tobacco control for 13 years, you kind of start seeing a pattern. You kind of start seeing, hearing similar stories and how they all connect together. And, you know, you start feeling that idea that when you, the kind of work that we do, whether it's COPD, helping with tobacco, helping people have better lives, it really improves our quality of life. And that's really important. And, in, and then it improves their family's quality of life. So it's really important work that we're doing here today. So thank you very much for both Valerie and Ralph for, for uh, being brave enough to share your story. Okay, so it's been a lot of listening and a lot of sitting down. So the next part is going to get you a little bit up and moving. We have with us um, from Oahu PT Specialists, uh, we have... Um, Bobby Tagawa and Bernie Soriano. Um, both Bobby and Bernie were raised in IEA. Uh, Bobby graduated from the University of Pacific Stockton, 
California with a master's degree in science with an emphasis in physical therapy, while Bernie has received his master's degree in physical therapy from Mount St. Mary's College in Southern California. They are co-owners of Oahu PT Specialists and have helped many, many people get up and moving. With tips on how to exercise safely and effectively with COPD, let us please welcome Bobby Tagawa and Bernie Seriano. So I'm Bobby Tagawa, and this is my partner, Bernie Soriano. Hello. And um, don't mind me if I'm moving back and forth, because I cannot stay still. Okay, that's just how I roll. <laughs> but um, so when somebody comes into our clinic with uh, COPD, our primary objective is to give them an uh, individualized exercise program. And that's highly variable from person to person, because there's different levels of comorbidities, different levels of exercise tolerance, and all their goal sets vary from person to person. So you definitely got to customize the program to them. Now today, um, we're going to go over some, some breathing exercises and its application to movement and your daily activities. Um, but with that being said, you know, why, why exercise? You know, uh, I get this question probably every week with uh, our patients that come in with COPD. I have COPD, this is an irreversible condition. You know, how is exercise gonna help me? You know, yes, yeah, COPD we know is irrevers irreversible, but the, um, the effects and how it affects your um, activities of daily living, we can address. Because there's many factors associated with just getting moving, besides just your pulmonary condition one of which is your neuromuscular system and your cardiovascular system, both of which you can make adaptive changes even with reduced pulmonary function. Okay. So going back to that high variability, you know, you, we would customize programs specific to the individual, and it can be daunting when somebody with COPD who gets tired very quickly just from standing up or even sitting unsupported to hear those words exercise. You know, and we understand that because in the traditional sense, you know, exercise can be associated with, can be associated with some gym programs like a treadmill, stationary bike, let's do some light weights, go for a walk. Well, some, some individuals can't even sit. So it's hard to expect them to go walking for 15 or 20 minutes. You know, and with that variability, even as examples, you know, we have a patient right now, her primary goal is to be able to take a bath independently. She requires oxygen and assistance to take a bath from her daughter, and she's 61 years old. So that, that can be quite challenging to cope with. You know. But we tailor her program as an interval program, meaning that her inability to sit for long periods of time is not only associated with her reduced pulmonary function, but she has reduced trunk strength, she has reduced hip flexibility, all of which you can make adaptive changes with progressive exercises associated with those impairments in physical therapy. So what we did was we started her off on just a graded task such as sitting for five minutes or five seconds in a neutral, you know, um, ergonomically correct position as far as sitting is concerned, unsupported. And then we gave her intervals of rest, you know, like one to two minutes. Then we bumped it up to 10 seconds, interval for one to two minutes of rest. Then we bumped it up to 15 seconds. This program essentially encompassed um, what she did at home. So she would do those three reps maybe every three hours. And eventually she was able to get up to the point where she could sit for five minutes unsupported. You know, now she is still far from her ability to take a bath independently, but she's making graded steps to get there as opposed to traditionally what you would think of as making progressive changes such as continuous 
prolonged exercise. But you can still make adaptive change even with an interval program such as that. Whereas there's the other end of the spectrum, you know, there's people that are extremely high level, like my mother who's in the audience who has COPD. She can swim for like an hour. So her program would be obviously much different than the person who can't even take a bath on their own independently. So we customize the program for them. Yeah. Yeah, so where, where do you start? You know, no matter what level you're at, whether you're very high level as far as ability to tolerate activities for prolonged periods of time, or at that low level for some individuals who can't even stand or even sit unsupported, it, it would be a um, good measure to discuss these, these programs with your physician who can give you guidance. Because there's, there's always that fine line on understanding how much to push yourself and when to pull back. And with the guidance of your physician who understands your comorbidities, your current exercise intolerance, and your goal set, they, they can help guide you, this along with possibly even a physical therapist. So how do you start a physical activity program? Um, you know, these are general guidelines, you know, as far as warming up, you know, cool down, gradually build up to a certain duration of time. But again, it's highly individualized in how we approach any specific program for people dealing with COPD. So if we had to generalize this, this is what it would be. But again, it, it we highly suggest that you discuss this with your physician and they can customize a program, maybe along with physical therapists, to tailor your needs. Some general guidelines, you know, the, these basically follow suit with what I was discussing earlier, but at the, at the same token, this is, in a general sense, how you would approach exercise. But again, it's, it's, it's highly variable, highly individualized, and again, we, we highly recommend that you discuss it with your physician and how you approach getting started with activity in general. Okay, so probably the most important thing to do during exercise, or for that instance, every day, is breathe. And not only breathe, but breathe correctly. Um, people with COPD obviously have very much difficulty even sometimes breathing at rest. Um, there are two main types of breathing that we instruct or educate people on. One is called pursed lip breathing, and the other is called diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, for many of you, this may be a review, but it'll be kind of good to review and go over these type of kind of breathings. First, lip is, first up is pursed lip breathing. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, Basically going to inhale through your nose and then exhale through pursed lips. I can see you guys all trying that. That's pretty good. Um, general rule of thumb is it should take approximately twice as long for you to exhale as it is it to inhale. So in this case here, approximately two seconds in and through pursed lips, about four seconds key point is to really breathe out slowly and gently through those pursed lips. Don't force the expiration. Um, the goal with this, obviously, is to try to improve your oxygen saturation uh, to uh, maximize um, short or decrease the effects of shortness of breath and or fatigue. Again, per person, it's different. Sometimes you can breathe longer. Sometimes you can take in more breath, sometimes less breath, but give or take. Two in, four out. The next is called diaphragmatic breathing. Um, for all of you sitting here, ideally you start lying down, but if you could, everybody could put one hand on their kind of neck chest area here. Um, one hand on their, oh, coughing. One hand on their stomach. Um, and just, just breathe. And just see which hand tends to move more than the other. Just kind of breathe in. Because ideally, our hand on our stomach should be the one moving more than the one on our neck chest area. But people with COPD, they tend to be so quote unquote neck breathers. Um, our neck muscles, they're, they're good, but they're not as effective as, as our diaphragm. So we really need to kind of train that diaphragmatic breathing with patients 
with COPD. Um, so it's a good tactile cue. So practicing both pursed lip breathing and diaphragmatic breathing, as you inhale, see if you can kind of inflate that, that stomach. Try to push your hand that is on your stomach out. And then exhale through pursed lips and try to let that stomach flatten. Some of us kind of flatten the stomach as much as others, sorry. But inhale through your nose, inflate that stomach, and exhale. Trying to flatten that stomach. Again, nice, low, deep breaths, nothing rushed, um, with intolerance. Again, initially we train it in lying, being unsupported. Of course, you translate that to sitting, standing, and then, of course, we bring this to our exercises and try to incorporate it with everyday activities as well. This rate of perceived exertion is a scale that we use in the clinic. Again, like Bobby was talking, how we definitely try to um, individualize each person's program. And so again, each person's tolerance is very variable. So this scale basically helps to guide us and the patient to um, assess their rate of perceived ex exertion. When exercising, again, in general terms, we try to keep it around a three or a four, moderate to somewhat heavy type of tolerance. And of course, we try to gauge that from treatment to treatment, day to day, um, and progress from there. Just another um, visual for that. So we'll try to incorporate some of the breathing with some exercises as demonstrated here. Um, hopefully all of you guys got some piece of bands there, I see. Thank you for passing those out. So as our model is demonstrating here, you can do it in sitting. We're going to start with arms in front of you, about chest shoulder height. Good. And as you inhale through your nose, try to pull that out towards your sides. Try to really expand those lungs. Get those lungs open. Oh, try to hold on to the, to the band. Don't, don't hurt nobody next door. Be careful. Uh, I forgot about the dangers of exercise. Um, and as, as you exhale, bring it back to the center or the starting position. Again, coordinate. When you inhale, you're bringing the band out to the side. Again, try to think about that two count out, four count release. And in general, again, usually try to perform between 10 to 12 reps, around three working sets. Like, again, very, very general guidelines, depending on <laughs> Gotta watch out over there. Um, try to be, um, again, with each patient, we try to be real specific. Um, Oh, yes, and I think, yeah, Valerie had printed handouts, so appreciate that. So it should be in the packets. Uh, one. Oh, too short? Oh, sorry. Budget cuts. <laughs> uh, um, we got one more exercise. We don't have to demonstrate it here because we're all seated. It's just trying to see how you can incorporate that with a, something that we all have to do every single day. We did it probably around at least 20 times today when you guys are here. We all have to stand up. We're all getting out of bed, out of the car, out of the seats, toilet, everything. Um, but basically, from a seated position to cube that diaphragmatic breathing, I have we have patients put their hand on their stomach, try to inflate that stomach. And as they stand, they're going to exhale all the way to full extension. Um, if you guys can, if you guys can. Oh, sure. Those that can participate and stand, please try for sure. Um, so as you, before you stand, try to put your hands on your stomach for me first. Get the edges of your seat, feet planted firmly on the ground. Yep, and as you stand, try to exhale, breathe out through your mouth. And then as you sit, try to inhale back through your nose. Good. And then right back up, exhale. Good times. Only 99 more times, guys. Let's go. <laughs> one more time. And one more time. Perfect. 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 Again, general. 10 to 12 reps, three working sets, very general guidelines. It just depends on each person's um, presentation. 
these are references if you guys so choose to see um, or look up but otherwise that's it that's it for us my name is Bernie this is Bobby thank we're from Central much. All Physical Therapy appreciate you guys thank you Great job, great job. Another, um, you know, another use that you can use this is you can, if you have somebody that you don't like. No, no, do, do only use this for exercising <laughs> because you can see the dangers of not holding on to it, to, um, to not holding on to it correctly. So thank you very much for that. Um, and you know that there's a, whenever, um, when I was doing tobacco cessation, face-to-face -face, face -to -face tobacco cessation, you always, you get sometimes the, the feeling, particularly with certain members saying, you know, I've been smoking for so long. Um, what does it matter? And for physical activity, too, it's like, you know, it's been so long. You know, what does it matter now? But what we have seen from research, and you can observe it in your own life, quitting smoking, starting physical activity and exercise, it doesn't matter when you start it. It always has a positive health effect. So even if it, not might, if might, it might not reverse the signs of COPD, or it might not reverse the condition, it certainly can improve the quality of life. Um, so at any point that you start, whether you know, you're 15 years old or you're 65, it doesn't matter when you start to make these life changes. It can still have a positive impact on your health and a positive impact on your mood, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, so it's never too early to start. It's never too late to start. So next, we are moving into a very important area. Uh, we have uh, a next speaker who has helped many people figure out how to balance caregiving, resources, and money for folks as they get older and need a little bit more help. Gary Powell is a respected business professional, and his first-hand knowledge and exposure to the needs of caregivers has led him to create the Caregiver Foundation, for which he serves as the executive director. So we have today talking to us about caregivers, money, and resources. Let's please welcome Gary Powell. How's it going? Good. How many of you have been a caregiver or known a caregiver? How many of you have ever needed care? I don't see nearly enough hands up. If I'm not mistaken, at some point in your life, someone had to take care of you. They had to feed you, carry you, bathe you, change your diaper. We've all been infants. So we've already received care. And sometimes in life, we may need that help again. And even more often, we may need to give that help to someone else. So when we talk about who are caregivers, it could be you, it could be me, it could be our neighbors. Sometimes we don't think about caregiving as more than just a job for people who perhaps are going into nursing or becoming a CNA, but actually caregivers can be your next door neighbor, the person who checks in on you to make sure everything's okay. It could be your cousin who's helping with the finances, managing the tax returns. There are so many areas that caregiving involves that almost anyone can be a caregiver. You've probably heard before that, uh, oh, I don't know how to use this thing. How do you do this? I have no idea how to make this thing work, Valerie. There, thank you. Somebody else can do it. So, caregivers all have certain concerns. If it's that person who's a professional caregiver, like I mentioned, a CNA, someone in a smock that does that job, yes. A little bit louder, how's this? Better? Okay, sorry. The concerns that hands-on caregivers have are pretty obvious. They need to know how to lift someone, how to bathe someone, how to help someone eat, how to do those physical things that someone might need help with. But the concerns for other caregivers might be a little bit different. It might be how to handle the stress of caregiving, how to deal with the family interactions, how to deal with the complexity of finding help, all those other things that 
involve many different areas in life that we don't necessarily think of as caregiving areas. I was going to say that Rosalind Carter has a very often uh, quoted statement. She says that there are only four kinds of people in the world. There are caregivers, people who have been caregivers, people who will be caregivers, and people who will need care. So we're all there. One of the concerns that I have with many caregivers is the lack of experience and expertise. Many family caregivers take on the task without knowing how to do things carefully. Our physical therapists can tell you that a lot of people come in with injured backs and they discover that these people are caregivers. They're trying to lift people and they do it improperly. So it's very important that we come to events like this, that we access websites that can help, that we go to support groups, go to different things where we actually can learn how to do the tasks and how to engage as a caregiver properly. Future care is just as important as present care. Some people would say it's more important. As long as I'm there, I can figure out how to take care of mom or I can take care of my disabled child, or I can help take care of my friend. But if I am not there, who steps in when I step out? We don't like to think about that. How many of you spend all day thinking, oh, I'm gonna not be here tomorrow, I better plan? Not many of us. But if we don't, we can make sure that the person we love that needs care isn't gonna get the same level that we've been providing. Unless we plan, things can change dramatically. There are many, many tools to help you plan financially, plan legally, all the different aspects of providing care, even when you're not there. An area that is even harder to think about and harder to deal with is the future planning for a person's final wishes. When I first started talking to my dad, who is now 83 and he's still doing pretty well, but I said, Dad, what is it you want to happen when you're gone? He said, why should I care? I'm gone. <laughs> I said, no, no, I didn't mean it that way. What I mean is, what do you want me to do? Again, he said, anything you want, I'm not here. But then he started thinking about it. And he said, you know, I have some particular things that I'd, I'd like done. And he told me his end of life wishes. And he told me whether he wanted to be buried or cremated. And he told me about the kind of service that he hopes we will be able to have. It was a hard discussion. A lot of tears fell. But it was an important discussion. Because otherwise, how would I know? I would be making decisions based on what I felt, not what he felt. When a person has a stroke or a heart attack and doesn't die... Sometimes they're not able to express their wishes anymore. If we haven't had these talks and these discussions, we don't know what they want. So we're not able to give them the care that perhaps they deserve. So try to have these hard discussions. We have handouts at the Caregiver Foundation to help you have those conversations. So feel free to contact me and ask for those helps. Okay. Now, I don't know what I did, but if you could change the slide again, somebody to the next one, maybe that thing. Okay, you have the outline over here, so if we don't get the slide changed, you can look at that. How do you do it? There's a mouse. Oh, here, just hit it. I don't deal well with computers. there okay you'll probably have to do that again sorry but caregiving and the providing care is expensive how many of you have let's just say about three million dollars that you can afford to spend on care no problem <laughs> nobody <laughs> boy I'm disappointed you haven't planned well <laughs> we set aside money for different things, 
but most of us don't set money aside thinking that we are going to need care. Some people have been able to buy long-term care insurance. Most of us can't afford it. Some of us have planned to leave a certain amount in the bank just in case. But unless that amount is huge, it won't be able to finance what we call long-term care, which is very different from medical care. We'll talk about that in a minute. So who pays for all of this? Well, you can pay out of your pocket and pay until there's nothing left, and then you start liquidating whatever you do have. Stocks, bonds, precious metals, your house, investments of businesses, whatever you have to turn into cash to continue to spend. Most of us run out of money pretty quickly. If we have long-term care insurance and we can qualify for a claim, then we can use that. But qualifying for a long-term care insurance policy is not as easy as you think. You have to at least not be able to perform two normal activities of daily living, what they call ADLs, things like transferring from a bed to a chair. We all did that stand-up exercise, that's great. Maybe you can't do that anymore without assistance. That would be one qualifying factor. Or maybe you can't dress yourself, bathe yourself, feed yourself. But if you're able to do most of those and you just really would like some help cleaning the house because it really is hard for you to do it, to be able to get, get around doing that, your long-term care insurance isn't going to cover that. So you have to know the policy very carefully, talk with your agent, and understand what it takes to be able to have a claim pay. So what do we do when we run out of money and we don't have long-term care, what's left? People often tell me, Medicare. Wrong, sorry. If you open your Medicare handbook that comes every year, to about the third page, you'll see a statement in there. It says, Medicare does not pay for long-term care costs. That's not nice. Medicare is a medical insurance program. It pays for medically required care. So if you need medical care, Medicare is going to step up and help you with that. But most long-term care is not medically required. Now we think, wait a minute, if I can't feed myself, I'm going to starve to death. Well, that's probably true, but someone else can feed you, so they don't consider it medically required. If you have tube feeding needs, that can become a different issue. If you can't take a bath, you may become very, very dirty, but doctors don't say it will kill you, so it's not medically required. So Medicare doesn't help. So who does? You've run out of money, you've run out of long-term care insurance. Medicare says, well, you're fine, but you need a lot of help. The only government program is Medicaid. I like to say that Medicare and Medicaid are not M&Ms. Neither one of them tastes good. But Medicaid will pay for long-term care costs if you can qualify. Qualifying for Medicaid has two important factors. One, you have to qualify physically for long-term care needs. And two, you have to qualify financially with assets. You basically must not have assets that could have been liquidated or could be liquidated for your own care. And you have to have a level of care that meets their classification of long-term care. You can get a form and find out what that is, but they're, basically you need a lot of care to be able to qualify for Medicaid. You need, to call, you need to have what they call ICF level of care, which is one of the classifications uh, that I think Patricia Tom might be able to help us with better than my describing it. So, have I depressed everyone? Well, the good thing is, is that there are ways to plan for this. There are things that can be done to help when you need care. Most family care, let's see if I can do it. Oh, it's gone. The whole mouse is gone now. <laughs> Thank you, I didn't see you take the mouse. Most families provide the care that we need. When my grandfather had his first stroke, I was 13. 
I had five cousins and a brother who were older than I was, and I guess their teenage years had already begun, and mine hadn't gotten going, and I got to take care of Grandpa. I went to school, came home, took care of Grandpa, helped him eat, gave him his bath, took him walking. For the next four years, that's what I did. I didn't know that was caregiving. I was taking care of Grandpa. That's what families used to do traditionally. But today, we have more than one job. We're trying to make ends meet. Our, our families are all over the place. I have kids on the mainland. We're all, we have competing needs, far more so today than our parents did, and especially than the generations before them. So the traditional role of families is still there, but the stress involved and the complexity of a family providing care is much different. It's nice to have family around to take care. How many of you want your, of you men, how many of you want your daughter giving you a bath? You women, are you really looking forward to your sons helping you on the toilet? Not so nice an idea to look forward to. That may be necessary, but if we can plan differently, I think most of us would. If we don't have these talks with our family and help them prepare for potential care ne caregiving needs, we've not helped them and we certainly haven't helped ourselves. So the nice things about family giving care is that you know them. Hopefully they love you and they're there for you. The bad things are if they're not prepared, the stress that builds up in families, the strain between their own relations relationships between their kids, their spouses, the difficulty that it comes with having a job and trying to provide care. All of these things are not good parts of family care. They may be what we have to go through, but they may not be the best way. And what happens when a family has to provide care and they haven't planned and they haven't prepared properly, the family begins falling apart. At the time they need to gather together the most, all of this stress and anxiety and controversy over who's doing what begins fracturing the family. Pretty soon you have somebody who just doesn't come home anymore. They just can't handle all of that. And you have somebody that goes broke and has to file for bankruptcy. And you have somebody who's physically damaged because they didn't know how to provide care. So it goes back to preparing and really understanding what can be done. But luckily, there are other resources if you're willing to ask. I'm born and raised here, and one of the first things I was told is do not ask for any help. If you can't do it yourself, don't do it or ask your family. Don't go around the community saying you need help doing something. It's hazukashi. It's embarrassing. I can remember the time I brought a neighbor home to help me do something, and my dad got very upset. He said, that makes it look like I, can, I can't help you, or I don't know how to help you. And he didn't like that. Caregivers, if you're going to have that attitude, you're going to have a very hard life. Because there are people who will help if they know how and they know what help you need. If you go to your friends and you're saying, oh, when they ask you how is how are things at home? And you say, oh, everything's fine. No problem. We're handling. It's okay. No problem. They don't know what you need. If they say, well, call on me if you ever need anything. Let me know what I can do. Oh, it's, okay, sure. Nice. Thank you. Tell them. You think you could bring meals over every other week on Thursday night so I could have an hour off? Tell them that. You're going to be amazed at the response you get. People will say, Thursday nights? Yeah, I can do that. Or how about dad has to go to the exercise program on Saturday morning, but my kids have to go to the swimming lesson. I need somebody to drive him. Do you think you could do that? You'll be amazed. Somebody in your circle is going to say, I think I can help you with that. You have to be willing to ask. People want to help, but if they don't know what help to 
to give you, then they're not going to be able to help. Churches and temples are a source. If you attend church or go to a temple, those people tend to be more inclined to help than others. Interestingly enough, most churches and temples do not have a formal program to help caregivers. The Caregiver Foundation actually has a program that we share with religious organizations to help them develop a program in their congregations and in their, their groups to reach out into the community and help people with their care needs. Community organizations are there. We have the uh, Donna Project. It's a great, or, uh, great organization that has some specific areas that they will help with. There are other organizations like that that you can make contact with and get additional help. Support groups are probably one of the most important things for any caregiver to get involved with. Whether it's a condition-specific support group like COPD support groups or the Kidney Foundation support groups, Alzheimer's, or just a general caregiver support group, these support groups are very, very important to get involved with. When a caregiver support group meets, everyone in it knows what's going on. Sometimes caregivers don't want to quite be honest with everybody about how they're feeling about caregiving. I had a gentleman at a caregiver support group recently who sat down and was very quiet through the entire meeting, did not say a thing until the very end. He looked up and he said, I'm going to kill her tonight. I can't take this anymore. Whew. I was a little shocked. Guess what? Nobody at the table was. They just all went, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I know how you feel. He didn't go home and kill her, which was nice. <laughs> but he had a safe place to say that. And people were able to give him help. It's so important to be with others who really do know what you're going through. So find a support group. If you can't, call me up. We have lists of all kinds of support groups all over the state, and we'd be glad to put you in touch with one of them or invite you to one of the support groups that we sponsor. If you can find a professional care manager, you'll find that that is a tremendous help in your caregiving journey. It's a resource that is extremely important. We provide care coordination for a lot of people in, on all the different islands. And it takes so much stress off of that individual. You usually have to pay something for this service. But they're the ones that can go out and find the right pieces to your caregiving puzzle and put it together and then make sure that it sticks together. So if you can, try to find that. If you're coming out of a hospital, find the social worker at the hospital. It's a great resource. They'll be able to plug you in with different uh, providers and different resources that will help you. I've been a caregiver for a long, long time now. I haven't ever regretted it. I've caregiven for many different people with different needs. Often we hear caregiving referred to as a total negative. It's really not. If you prepare, if you make use of resources, if you get the financial side of it figured out, it can actually be a time of bonding. It can be a time that brings a family closer together instead of falling apart. It can be a time of you spending quality time taking care of someone that you love. Thanks very much. Great presentation. Thank you very much. A very difficult subject a lot of times, you know, to be able to approach um, in any family. Depend, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are or where you are in your life um, span. I think that that's a very important, but a lot of times very difficult. And um, I did take a chance, get a chance to view the website, your website last night as I was um, researching about all of our different speakers. There's a lot of great resources on his website, uh, on the Caregiver Foundation website. Um, a lot of articles, a lot of links to a lot of different places. And I think the idea is that regardless of what, where you are in your, in your progression as a human being, um, 
this is important stuff for all of us because whether we are at that age or somebody else in our life may be at that age. And we never know when that might happen. And so very important information, very good topic to be able to bring up to all of us. All right, we're nearing the end of our program and we have finally, last but not least, um, a great speaker who has a, a great deal of experience in home health care. Um, we have uh, Patricia Tom, who's a retired home health nurse, uh, with a bachelor's degree in science and nursing and is a, a registered nurse. She's going to talk to us about getting medical help in your home. Let's please give a, a warm welcome to uh, Patricia Tom. Hi. It's a pleasure for me to be here to speak to you all about something that I'm really very passionate about. And like Gary mentioned, caregiving is a very, very um, special, like, gift. I've been a caregiver. Uh, my mother-in-law is 97 years old and passed away about a year ago. And that was about oh, six months after I retired. I am, I have been a home health nurse with Castle Home Care for 20 years prior to my retirement. And I've been a nurse for over 40 years. And home health is something that is um, very near and dear because it's people like you, patients who have COPD, that we've cared for a lot. And I was um, a manager at, a, at the home health agency for maybe 15 of the 20 years that I worked there, and um, I've been blessed by many people, the patients as well as the caregivers. So what I want to present to you today is what options you have out there in the community that can help you get through this. The, Caregiver Foundation sounds excellent, something that probably we could have used 20 years ago and hopefully are making use of now. So you've got in your handouts the, the slides, okay? So Medicare, there, so back to what Gary was talking about, Medicare versus Medicaid. Medicare is what you have as, most of you over 65 has, have as insurance. So you may have straight fee-for-service Medicare, or you may have your Akamai Advantage, or some of those other supplementals. Now, Medicare Home Health is skilled intermittent nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, social workers, and a home health aide. Intermittent means that a nurse, will come, a nurse or therapist will come and give you an evaluation. They are required to have a physician's order, and also um, it has to be skilled care, medically necessary, and the patient needs to be homebound and have an able, willing caregiver. So if you are discharged from a hospital, or if you're at home and you have an exacerbation of your, your COPD or any other disease, you can have your physician write an order for home health. There are several home health agencies on the island and on the neighbor islands that are, medically certi are Medicare certified. You, get, you qualify for it as long as you have a medical necessity. So if you are at home and you don't want to be the revolving door in the hospital, so you don't want to keep going back to the hospital every month, you get an exacerbation of your COPD and you just tell your doctor, I'm really having a problem here, and, but I don't want to go to the hospital. The doctor says, okay, I'm going to put you on this medication, blah, blah, blah. However, you don't get better, but you still don't want to go to the hospital, and he doesn't think you need to be in the hospital, he can write an order for home health. He can call a home health agency, and you can get a nurse to come in and do an evaluation. She, can be, she or he can be the eyes or ears for the doctor. So the doctor then makes the referral. A nurse comes out, evaluates you, gets back to the doctor, 
and tells the doctor what your condition is in. Then, if you need, you can get a physical therapist to help you ambulate in your home, learn some breathing techniques, do your household chores if you need to, and as you progress and you get better, then you get discharged from this episode. The certification period is 60 days. You can get recertified if you are still homebound and it's medically necessary. This is not a one-time deal. You can get home health again in six months if you need to, if you get another exacerbation. So what home health is supposed to do is to help you not get rehospitalized. So the goal is to prevent rehospitalization. An able willing caregiver is like what Gary was talking about. Somebody who can be there for you if you need to. Doesn't have to be a family member. It can be the neighbor, your cousin, the nephew, or someone that you can rely on. But there has to be somebody willing to be instructed and this is what the nurse does also, instructs you, the caregiver, on how to provide the care, how to get the patient out of the bed, how to feed them, how to set up the room, how to set up the bathroom. The therapist can come in and also help with um, durable medical equipment, where to put the grab bars, how to get the wheelchair in and out of the house, how to get the showers, how to get you in and out of the shower. That's where also the, social, the home health aid comes into play. The home health aid will come and help you with the bath maybe two or three times a week, depending on the need. So there are options out there. And yes, Medicare does not pay for hired help. So the nurse, the therapist, and the aides are not going to stay there you know, three or four hours a day. There's then the social worker who can help you find the care. They can come in, do an evaluation, give you community, excuse me, community resources that can help you provide the care and the ongoing care, the long-term side of it. So then, so that's where, oh, where am I? Okay. All right, I'm kind of going up ahead here. Nice pictures. Val did that for me. <laughs> okay, let me just make sure. I just have, I've just done this for so long that I kind of just, it just comes out. So, um, and the, there are care homes, and then there are the hired caregivers, which are not covered by Medicare. So like I said, the social worker can help you set that up. As long as there's a medically necessary episode and the skilled, person, the skilled nurse or therapist is in on the case, the social worker can come in and do the evaluation and help you plan, okay? There are a number of certified care homes in, on the islands. The Department of Health, I believe, has that whole list in, on their website. And durable medical equipment, before you leave the hospital, that's the easiest time to get a lot of these, a lot of the, the durable medical equipment ordered. Medicare doesn't pay for 100% of all of this, and sometimes they only pay for one thing. So they'll pay for your walker, but they won't pay for the wheelchair. They won't pay for the bedside commode. Any personal care items Medicare does not cover. And when you get the therapist in with the skilled home health, she or he will be able to tell you how to set up the, where to put the grab bars, how to set up the bedside commodes, and if you need a raised toilet seat. People don't realize that um, to get off of a toilet is really difficult for people who are, are, have exacerbation of COPD or as they age. Toilets are really kind of low. <laughs> we just installed some um, uh, new, new toilets in our house, and I'm like, this toilet is too high. But I'm realizing that 
the lower toilets really are difficult for people to get out of. So when, if you're redesigning your house or you need a new toilet, um, get an ADA-approved toilet. It will help. Adult daycare. It was a lifesaver for us when my mother-in-law started um, getting some dementia. We, put her, we had her attend a, an adult daycare. I found out recently that long-term care insurance does cover adult daycare. They have a clause in it where there's a section that says community, community um, resources. And it's under there, it says adult daycare. You can put your loved one there for two or three times a week or every day. It's very, it is very beneficial. They provide meals and there are, loca- they are, there are various ones throughout the island. You all received one of these senior handbooks from American Savings Bank. This is a wealth of information for anybody who is looking for community resource information. There are support groups like um, Gary was referring to, and there is one at Castle Medical Center uh, the last Thursdays of the month, and it is run by one of the home health nurses. Her name is Sue Pignataro. She's been doing this support group, oh gosh, for maybe 15 years now. And um, it is, like Gary said, it's a wealth of, it's, it's just a gold mine for caregivers because it's, like he said, a safe place for you to be able to say, I'm frustrated, I don't know what to do, I need somebody to talk to. And then there's the one in Wahiawa. And I, I imagine you can call Gary and find out how many more there are out there. So we talked about that. All right. I could go on forever, however. <laughs> I think I don't have forever. (laughs) Thank you all very much, and we'll be on the panel if you have any questions. So thank you very much to Patricia and Gary and all the the other speakers we have. Um, We're going to invite them back up onto our panel. Uh, where we're going we're gonna to be able to take questions. Um, and then what I'll do, Valerie, maybe is I can take one of the microphones and walk around. So that... Oh, okay, great. Oh, that's great. Oh, okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and invite our speakers back up. Uh, and as they're doing that, you know, make sure that you have, this is in your packet, this is the evaluation uh, for the COPD day for today, this is the lifeblood of programs like this. The way that you can get funding, the way you can make it free, the way that you can get um, donations for uh, the lunches that you're going to receive uh, is by providing evaluation data. So if you can make sure that you complete this, you will also need this in order to be able to get your lunch. <laughs> so this is your meal ticket. Uh, and make sure that you fill out both the front and the back. Um, there will be people coming around to collect them and also to hand the lunches. So make sure that you have this completed at the, um, by the end of the by, the, by the time that people are coming to collect it. Do we have everybody on the, and then I believe that there, there are some students that are going to take these microphones? Is that? So it sounds like there's also going to be prize giveaways, so you don't want to leave right now. Wait until after the prizes.
Press it out. Okay, the first one's going to Rowan. Oh, he's already standing up. Okay, we'll, we'll take another another prize and then we'll we'll answer questions if anyone has a question. Oh, there's a another prize entry form. Can someone go get another prize entry form? Okay. Who wants to enter the prize? Are there any more entry forms? <coughs> Throw this in the bag. Irene Lenchanko. Okay, prize for Where's Irene? Irene? So does anyone have any questions for the panel? And before we um, forget, I wanted to mention if you think you could benefit from physical therapy, like from the physical therapist at Central Oahu Physical Therapy or any other physical therapy, you can ask your physician. And if your physician thinks that it's a good thing, he can prescribe it. And it will be covered to some degree by your medical plan if the medical plan and your doctor think it's a good thing. So I know that I have had it um, when I went to Denver to National Jewish. The doctor said, you know, I think it would be good for you to have an assessment to find out what you can do, what you can't do, and whether they can help you develop an exercise plan. Because I was afraid of injuring myself because I was shocked to find out I was even had COPD. I was like, what do you mean I have COPD? I, I've never, I never smoked. Why should I have that? And they're like, well, it doesn't matter. You have it, so you got to deal with it. So I said, okay. So the doctor did send me to a physical therapist, and we worked together, and they taught me about the Borg scale, which was like the exercise scale that they have on the handout. And so they, they taught me to be better at knowing when I am at, you know, a level one versus a level 10 or somewhere in between so that you can learn to pace yourself safely. And they also taught me how to use the oximeter where you, you put it on your finger and you can make sure you stay saturated. And if you don't, then you can learn to use oxygen while you exercise so you can exercise safely. So all of those things are things that you can get if you ask your physician. You've got to give him feedback, right, Dr. Sato? Yeah, we appreciate it. And we appreciate your feedback so that we can, you know, help manage you, manage and, you know, um, devise the best plan um, as possible. Make sure that you're taking your medications appropriately, uh, correctly, and that if we need um, some adjusting, that could even work, you know, work even better. Uh, we don't know that unless you help give us that feedback. And so that's really important for us. Uh, you know, I haven't, um, but part of that is I'm not sure how to and who to refer patients to. It's easier when, you know, they're coming in through the hospital, but in an outpatient setting where we want to try to avoid and prevent that, um, you know, I'm not, even I'm not sure, you know, who and how to get patients, who qualifies for that. Um, in general, I just try to suggest different kind of exercises, even, you know, routine things, being around the house, doing chores, walking, um, and trying to get a sense for whether a person is able to do that, do that is willing to do that, and just really trying to, you know, promote activity there. Dr. Sato, mm -hmm. if your patient is homebound and has an able, willing caregiver, you can get physical therapy without the nurse okay. through a home health agency. Okay. Just so tell them you need a PT, Valen. And treatment. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just telling Dr. Sato that if a patient is homebound and has uh, physical therapy needs, he can order that through a home health agency and get your get it um, that way. We have a question from. Can COPD be reversed? Oh, for me. The question was, can COPD be reversed? Uh, you know, some of the damage that's done 
uh, may be irreversible, especially when it comes to destruction of the airways. Uh, the way we assess how much benefit you can get, I mean, there's no way to know until you, you, you stop uh, exposing yourself to those exacerbating triggers. So say there's, you're still smoking, you're exposed to chemicals, fumes, then by stopping those things, we can see a rebound, an improvement in your lung function, like we saw on the graphs. You know, some of that lung that's inflamed, some of it is destroyed and is irreversible. Some of the lung is injured but can recover. And so we don't know unless you stop, you know, exposing yourself to that trigger. If you've removed yourself from that, you know, unfortunately, some of that damage is permanent, is done. But the, what we try to emphasize is, again, is optimizing and making the most out of the lung that's there by using medicines, uh, physical therapy, oxygen if needed, uh, and then we can still get some improvement from you know, what functioning lung you have. Anyone else want to chime in? Forty percent of his lungs, uh, use of forty percent. Well, how do you know you have forty percent? And from year to year, do you take a like a pulmonary function to find out if you made improvement or not made improvement? How do you know those things? So I think uh, Ralph had mentioned that you know his his capacity and that uh, that is uh, based on his lung function tests, those breathing tests that we can perform, uh, spirometry and the more extensive uh, breathing tests that we can do. And that gives us an idea of what's going on in the lungs, how strong they are. And that's based, it's compared to other women or men of your age, of your height, and where you should be. And so we get an assessment of where you are at, and we can use that to monitor your progression. If it doesn't change over time, if it gets worse, if medicines help to make it better. Um, and so that's how we would monitor and we can do that. Um, sometimes six to 12 months, we'll check that. And a lot depends on your overall health, how you're doing. If you're having worse symptoms, we might do it sooner. If you're doing well, you're doing more, walking farther with less symptoms, no hospitalizations, there might not be a need to check it every six months, right? So a lot depends on the, the total picture, the complete picture of how a person is doing. Um, but if you just want to say basics, sure, we could do it once a year, but really it depends on the individual and how they're doing. And some doctors like to also do it uh, a short while after you start a new medication to see if it has made a difference, made it better, made it worse. And also, a lot of times they like to wait a while after you've had an infection because your lung function will probably be bad for a while until your body fully recovers from whatever your infection was. And the other thing is to not get too hung up on numbers because I know some of us really like numbers because we think that's real versus how much we can do. And I think it's really important for us to realize, even with, like I am sometimes at 40%, and sometimes I'm at 30%. Sometimes I'm, the highest I've ever been is 50%. But I can still do a lot of things that I've told I'm not supposed to be able to do. And a lot of it is, you know, the big muscle in our head and also exercising. So I think we have to realize the more we do, the more we can do. I think that's a good point about the numbers that um, I'll have patients that have lower numbers that can't, you know, that can do a lot more than someone with higher numbers that can't do as much or, you know, have that variability in how symptomatic they are um, and how much they can do. Um, and so again, it's, it's everything, put it together. It's your symptoms, how you feel, what you can do. The breathing test is just one part of the total picture. Other questions? I believe there's a question back there. Um, hi, I have a question. It's kind of, I guess, an anatomical, maybe physiological, but 
maybe for the past 15 years, I've had diagnoses like allergic asthma, chronic bronchitis, and at one point I had sleep apnea, had a problem with sleep apnea. But more, most recently, it, it seems like it's gotten worse for some reason. My condition has exasperated. But I wanted to ask you about something I haven't been experiencing, and I have asked the doctor about, but I, I don't know, maybe he's never been asked before, but I've had this problem, like I lie on my stomach, I feel like I'm suffocating. So I turn over on my back, and then I can breathe. But because it's progressively getting worse, then one night I'll lie on my back, and then I feel like I'm suffocating. So um, it doesn't work anymore. So then I have to sit up. And then that's the only way I can breathe. And sometimes I have to sleep sitting up. But then it was getting really worse because then I would, I was having trouble breathing, so I would sit up, and then that wasn't helping anymore. It's like, first I can't lie on my stomach, then I can't lie on my back, then I can't sit up. And then what am I supposed to do? Is now I gotta stand up and sleep, I, you know. And it, it, you know, I'm just kind of scratching my head, like, is this SIDS? You know, I mean, you know how babies can't sleep? They say, don't mm -hmm. put baby on the <coughs> back, on their stomach. I'm just wondering, what does that sound like to you? <laughs> well, um, it's, it's a little uh, more difficult to really come up with a diagnosis. I mean, the symptoms you're describing are not typical of asthma or allergic, you know, uh, bronchitis or allergic rhinitis. I think it's going to be important to really get a more thorough, complete, you know, history, evaluation uh, for me to be able to say what might be going on. Um, the things you mentioned already with asthma, and you've had this diagnosis of asthma, bronchitis, uh, sleep apnea, those things uh, can be positionable, but more, more so with sleep apnea, and more so when you're on your back. To get more short of breath on your, when you're lying on your front, um, that's a little bit more atypical. And so, you know, I'd be concerned about something in the airway, soft tissue that's causing more obstruction, collapse. But there's a lot of different things that, you know, could be contributing to that. Even other, you know, non-lung related things, your heart, uh, if there's fluid in the lungs, or overload in the heart. I mean, so there's uh, not just asthma or, seal or sleep apnea. Um, mm -hmm. I'd be concerned at look, looking at everything um, and just starting from scratch in a way and seeing is there anything else that could be contributing to those symptoms because that's not uh, typical. So what kind of doctor should I go to? Should I go to a doctor like you or, I mean, a um, <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, obviously, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I usually no. get a blank stare when I ask, like, a family practitioner or an internist. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think to start things off, if, he, if you've already had that diagnosis of asthma, bronchitis, sleep apnea, then I'd go with that there is some suspicion of something lung-related going on then you could ask to be referred to a, a lung specialist. Uh -huh. And you know, if there, it's primarily lung related, then hopefully that will do the trick to help you know, figure things out, better treat you, better manage you, and get you feeling better. Um, but you know, right now, it's, I'm sure you're on a lot of the treatments for those diseases as well to try to help things. But if it's not getting better, or maybe it just takes optimizing, you know, adding some things in, um, or finding out if there's something else going on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. There was a question in the back. Yeah. Hi. I was wondering if there's any suggestions or resources on, like, sometimes people don't realize what they're doing in terms of exacerbating triggers. And, uh, you know, maybe a third party or someone can come over and assess the home situation, the environment, and the lifestyle and kind of give you an idea of, oh, you know, is the damp environment where I live affecting me? Is the cat dander an issue? Um, you know, I'm drinking soda and I'm eating processed meats with nitrates in it, et cetera, et cetera, and things that could improve your situation. Um, I think in our current environment where they're trying to cut back and cut back for reimbursements, I think we all have to be our own best investigators and try to figure out, that's why we have upstairs the journal, so that you can keep track of what things seem to make symptoms worse. You know, 
exposure to mold, exposure to moisture, exposure to, you know, heat, like um, Ralph was saying, when he's around hot things, it bothers him, and he has to, you know, you have to actually be a detective, and then you can, you can work with an allergist, perhaps, if you think allergies make things worse, or Dr. Sato can, can, can work with you, too, because you guys deal with allergies, too, right? Yes, and if it, you know, a lot of it is observation, is trying to pick up, you know, those triggers that you notice cause your symptoms to get worse. And if we need to confirm it, we can order blood tests or, and if it seems pretty complicated or you have a lot of allergies and the, just the standard treatments aren't effective enough, then we could refer you to an allergist as well. So we work closely with allergists, ear, nose, throat uh, specialists, because a lot of times there could be anatomic, um, you know, areas that could be improved on. And so there's a lot of different specialists that uh, could help, and then we can help facilitate referring you to the, the those other specialists as well. So is there like a list of exacerb common exacerbating triggers, or it's different for everybody, every COPD uh, patient? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, there's, I mean, I think a lot of resources that will list the, the most common triggers uh, for allergies and asthma, and there's a lot of overlap with allergies and asthma, right? It's a hypersensitive reaction to something in the environment that causes allergies. Your body's trying to evacuate it from you breathing it in your nose, so you get runny nose, congestion, sneezing, watery eyes, and when you get it down into your lungs, it causes tightening, inflammation, and it causes shortness of breath, wheezing. So there's a lot of overlap, but the the Internet, I mean, if you looked for common triggers for asthma or allergies, I'm sure you could find something. And then when we evaluate patients, we'll ask about those common triggers. Um, and then you can also still do blood tests, looking for high levels of antibodies in, the, in your body that are re, could be reacting to those triggers. And there's a common you know, collection of blood tests that come with that. Uh, and also skin testing. And so there are ways to to try to you know find out the most common things. And then sometimes we just don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things that aren't on that panel that gets tested. Um, and it's still hard to control, you know, prevent you from the VOG from coming in or a change in the weather. So even if you know that's a trigger, then it becomes now trying to avoid those things, but also p potentially using medicines to help you and just what, what things work the best. And one of the triggers that are not commonly mentioned is gastric reflux. They find that a lot of people that have respiratory problems also have gastric reflux or GERD or acid reflux. And if you control that well, that can affect your breathing. So have you found that with your patients, doctor? Yes. Uh, I always ask about nasal allergies, acid reflux, as other medical conditions that can worsen asthma. I mean, so there's the, the well-known ones, uh, lung-related things, uh, but definitely optimizing your nasal allergies and acid reflux um, because that acid, if you can imagine, the acid comes up up through the, from the esophagus into the back of the throat. And when you're laying flat at night, especially, or even if you have daytime symptoms, that acid, it's caustic, it burns. And if it trickles into the airway, which, which are already inflamed, that exacerbates that inflammation. And so you really, um, it's something that's easy to ask about. And even if you're not sure, it's the treatment is usually has very low side effects. So sometimes we'll treat people if there's even a question. If you have coughing at night, that taste of the back of your throat or bad breath when you wake up or the actual sensation of heartburn, you know, it's something that's easy to try to treat and can help your asthma significantly. Other Thank questions? You. I think we had a question somewhere here in the middle. Yep, there's a question. Okay. This question is for Dr. Sato. Mm -hmm. I noticed uh, you had llama on your slides. Yes. How does that work? So <coughs> the that medication. Oh, so the question was. On the slide that I had, um, some of the medications were classified as a LAMA, L-A-M-A. Uh, it's an abbreviation for a long-acting muscarinic anticholinergic uh, blocker. 
So it's <clears throat> the receptors on the smooth muscle that encircle, that encircle the airways. And so those receptors are responsible for causing constriction and tightening of the airways. And so those medicines help to block those receptors from working. So by doing so, it helps to relax the airways. And it's uh, just a class, that's the mechanism uh, of action by which those medicines work. And there are different medicines that work in different ways to do the same thing, that try to relax the airways and open it up. Um, the llamas are a little bit favored uh, in a way compared to some of the other uh, smooth muscle relaxants that like albuterol and the long acting forms of albuterol because they can be associated with um, fast accelerated heart rates some jitteriness and those uh, the llamas don't traditionally cause that um, as much and but they are both used and they can be both both be very effective I think the the important thing is to see which ones work the best for you because people will respond differently to different medicines and so it's really trying it out and seeing which ones work well. Um, and then of course your physician can kind of curtail which one they'd want to try first based on you know um, the individual. Other questions? Here's a question over. Hi, um, for Dr. Sato, because you're the sleep specialist, do you have any general um, suggestions as far as um, aiding sleeplessness for COPD patients that you found that works for most people? I'm sorry, so your question was, was there any um, general recommendations for patients with COPD in terms uh, of and sleep? sleeplessness, difficulty sleeping, or aiding their sleeping? Yeah, um, well, that, COPD, there's a high association, you know, with an asthma, with other um, sleep disorders, insomnia, sleep apnea. And so, um, I mean, the, the big thing is to try to really optimize your, your lung disease because a lot of times the symptoms are worse at night. And so you really want to optimize your breathing because if you have also a sleep disorder, it can compound the, the symptoms and, you know, that disrupts your sleep, especially with something like obstructive sleep apnea. So if you have an underlying lung disease that causes tightness in the airways, less airflow, less oxygen, uh, on top of having sleep apnea, which is a disorder where you have upper airway collapse and you have less airflow, you know, that means less airflow coming into lungs that are already tight and constricted. So it adds to that um, you know, less airflow and less oxygen a lot of times. So people can have even lower drops of oxygen. Uh, so I mean, the, the take home is, you know, really trying to optimize your lung disease and optimizing your sleep apnea also. And I think a lot of times when you treat the sleep or your lung disorder, the sleep gets better. Um, and so, you know, it really, they kind of go hand in hand um, to try to optimize your sleep. There's a question all the way in the back. Yes. Oh, this is for Dr. Sato. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there any kind of natural healing things that we can take to enhance all of the drugs that we're taking? Because I take so much drugs that my I started having GERD, and they're saying that it can't be helped because you're taking all these drugs. But is there something, like people keep on telling me, there must be something out there, natural healing things that we can incorporate in addition to all these meds that we are taking. You're ask, asking if there are other natural, like herbal, yeah. uh, medicinal things yeah. that can help with your COPD in particular, or? COPD, and I have asthma. And asthma. You know, um, <clears throat> I'm not aware of any other types of uh, naturopathic type medications um, and a lot of it is, is you know we really want um, that medical evidence that supports uh, consistent um, efficacy that it works well that it's safe um, you know there are things that some people will use um, 
that aren't necessarily a medication, even things like hormones can help to facilitate breathing, um, helps to uh, increase respiratory rate. And so some people may use something like that rather than um, the medications we have. But really, uh, in terms of a medicine that helps to relax the airways and reduce inflammation, um, you know, which is the core of the problem with COPD and asthma, I'm not familiar with anything that I could recommend. Uh, maybe somebody else on the panel knows. Um, the one thing that I did learn is there is a national database, and it's on your um, program under this page, and it has under the uh, Get Involved and under Resources, Alternative Medicine Database at the National Institutes of Health, um, HTTP uh, colon backslash backslash nccam.nih.gov. That has the largest database of uh, research on complementary and alternative medicines. And if you're thinking of taking any or are taking any of those medicines, it's good to double check and double check with your pharmacist as well because some of the medicines may conflict with um, these herbal remedies. And you might not think so, but it's always good to double check because you don't want to counteract the medicines you're taking and cause more side effects for yourself. And that's why it's always good to make sure when you see your doctor to go over the supplements and everything else you're taking as well as the herbal medicine, I mean, as well as your, your prescribed medicines. And the pharmacist can go over those things with you too. There's a question over on the left side over towards the back. With the microphone, yeah. I, I had this question I was wondering now, five years ago, I had this coughing. I cough, cough, and the doctor treated me with allergy. But then he sent me to a vacation, so I went on a vacation far, far away from home, and my coughing went away. It didn't come back until last year. But this time, I went to the doctor, and the doctor told me I get COPD. So I just was wondering, what's the difference between the allergy and the COPD? Um, you know, a lot of times there's overlap with, again, I don't know if you had you saw that slide where COPD is really uh, encompasses a group of different lung diseases, including uh, emphysema, bronchitis, and asthma, because they all have inflammation of the airways in common. So a lot of times, you know, you can have an overlap where you have a component of asthma, type symptoms where it's triggered by something in the environment, something you breathe in that triggers the symptoms. And when you remove that trigger, you get better. And a lot of times when you kind of hear that situational, um, those flare of symptoms with change in geography or weather or something you breathe in, it's more of an allergic type component. But that can also happen with COPD. And when your doctor said COPD, I, I, I'm assuming that he means um, in terms of more destruction of the airways um, and maybe more irreversible damage, but I'm not sure what they mean because you can still have uh, the symptoms that you mentioned and that story with, with asthma. And so, you know, when you went away, it got better. When you came back, you were doing pretty well. Maybe your body was still in a state of, you know, not being inflamed, not having those triggers, but it took some time and your cough started to come back. Um, so it's, it's hard to say, you know, is it really a different diagnosis or is it, you know, just in that spectrum? And you always had the, the propensity to, to do that, to get better if you went away and it gets worse when you come back because of the triggers here. There's a question right here. What's the difference between the treatments we get at home, like with the nebulizers and stuff, than the hospital? I go in about twice or every two months I'm going in, and I'm on like 13 medications. Hmm. Um, so the nebulizers in the hospital and the yeah, ER when I go, Yeah, I go in there for treatment even though I have mine at home and the medications, but I got to go in there and I breathe better, and then they release me again, and then a couple months later, I go back in again. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, the delivery is supposed to be similar. I mean, the medication, dosage, and strength, um, 
but it's it, you know is there something different with steroids or something they use that we don't get at home uh it's only if the doctor is ordering something different i mean because you can get different medicines in that nebulized form so you can get the muscle relaxant you can get the steroids um in that inhaled setting with the nebulizer you can get just saline just salt water to moisturize things so you can get that in the hospital and you can get that at home so it's just a matter of if they're using the same things at home and as can they do in the hospital can we take steroid um, prescription like the hospital gives at home or is that only the hospital can do that no you can get a prescription to do instead of the inhalers that have steroids you yeah, can get a nebulized form of it because I get the nebulizer the um, albuterol mm -hmm. but they give me something in the hospital but I was going so much I gained weight but is there can they give you the steroid to take it home yep they can give you the nebulized form of that same steroid as you get as in an inhaler some people prefer getting it nebulized in that you know humidified mist form rather than an inhaler and they, so you can get it they do have nebulizers that use double AA, a triple a batteries that you can carry around if if you and your doctor agree that the nebulizer is the best way for you to get your medicines you can use a nebulizer that is about the size of a cell phone, maybe a little bigger. And they do sell them online. You need a prescription, but you can get them online or you can get them at a lot of pharmacies. So if you look around, you can find different ones. And some of them are, you know, they're, they're much smaller than when I first started using them that looked like a, you know, they used to be the size of a toaster and weigh about, you know, the, as much as a bowling ball. But now they're, they're light and portable. And like Dr. Sato says, they do have um, Pomocort, which is an inhaled nebulized steroid. And I have used that. And when I'm having an exacerbation, I would much rather treat myself in my house if I can stay healthy than go to the hospital and possibly get sick with somebody else's germs. Okay. <laughs> we have a, who has a microphone? Oh, okay, right there in the back. I have a two-part question. Um, I just got diagnosed with COPD. Um, I'm on a host of medications, and when I tell my doctor that, you know, I'm still having difficulty breathing with all these medications, he says that my breathing, I don't know what it's called, it's like your breathing capacity is up to 88%, so I'm supposed to be okay, but when I do any type of activities, I'm still short of breath, and he says, that's fine, that's good. Um, for me, <laughs> being short of breath when I'm doing anything is not good. Um, and the second part of my question, or I'm sorry, that first part was, when do you know too much, you know, the medication is just too much because they just keep adding on more and more medications. And the second part of my question is, I have a very busy schedule. Is that harming or helping my COPD? Um, so the first part of the question was, how do you know that you're getting maybe too many too much medication? Too much medication because it, um, my doctor just keeps adding on more and more medication and it just doesn't seem to be helping. Right. So, you know, when your symptoms are not getting better, um, you know, we usually try to see if is is the question um, or is the reason because you're not on the right medication? Is it, could it be better with a combination? Um, in which case, you know, it's, it seems reasonable based on your symptoms and if the lung function is reduced and it sh there's signs that it's still COPD that's causing the problem. So airway inflammation, you could try adding um, other medicines like we talked about the combination therapy. Uh, when it's too much, I'd say, you know, if it's not, you're not getting any additional improvement, either subjectively with improvement of your symptoms uh, or objectively with your lung function tests, then if it doesn't add any benefit, and I, you know, it's reasonable to stop that extra medicine. You're also looking out for side effects, right? If you're using even the same medicine and you're just using it more frequently, you want to look out for side effects as signs that you're overdoing it. And it might not even be, you know, the over the recommended amount. It could be the recommended frequency, but you could be developing symptoms and, you know, you're just sensitive to that medicine. So you may need to switch, switch to a different combination inhaler, different inhaler. Um, and you want to, 
you know, when someone's not getting better, when everything isn't really adding up, your lung function looks good. I mean, it could just be your, there's certain triggers that worsen your breathing, and when you do the breathing test, it's, it's better. Um, but you want to make sure that, that you're, you know, we're not missing something else. Is there something else contributing to your COPD? Um, you know, you can have other problems associated with COPD or other, other unrelated things that can cause the sensation of shortness of breath, but are completely unre unrelated to the lungs. You know, your heart, kidneys, fluid, um, the GI system, a lot of problems there can cause that sensation of shortness of breath. So it's, you know, is it using the right medicines and the right amounts or are we not treating the right thing, you know, when your symptoms aren't getting better? And then your the second question was, sorry, Having made myself a, forget. Having a busy schedule, is that helping or harming my COPD? Um, well, I think um, for me, I have learned the hard way that pacing is really, really important. I always tell people to pace, but... Personally, I don't do it very well. So my husband is really good at saying, um, I think, sweetie, we got a little too much on the plate. Let's put some things for tomorrow. It's okay that we don't do everything today. So I think it's important to have activities that fulfill us. But remember that when we try to do, you know, the extra 11th thing when we've already got, you know, 10 things on the plate, maybe the 11th thing, you know, we prioritize and we say, okay, which things can we put off till tomorrow or next week and which things really need to be done yesterday. And then, and then also we do it by energy level. Like for me, I have times when I have more energy than other times. And so learning yourself and when you have the most energy, my kids are most energetic around midnight, midnight to four, four in the morning. Uh, that's not a good time for me. I'm good about from dinner time till about 10 o'clock at night. So I do a lot of emails and texts and running around between 6 p.m. and 10, 10 p.m. And my husband is like, is this really the best time? Is it for me? <laughs> so I think we all have to learn to figure out what works best for us, even if it might be unorthodox. We're right at time, so I think we have time for one more question. Okay, last question, and then we'll do drawings and lunch. Oh man, uh, people, uh, I stopped breathing for 45 minutes to, to a minute, and I was concerned and alarmed, because I don't ever remember stopping breathing before, in, involuntarily. Uh, a year and a half ago, a doctor said that I had asthma. Uh, she examined me. Uh, is it possible that I have any of these other illnesses and not asthma, or is it definitely asthma, because asthma makes you stop breathing for a minute and you get alarmed? It's emphysema, chronic. I thought I might have chronic bronchitis. Oh. I, I, I don't get the asthma. And, and for me, the COPD is a serious business, but if I just quit smoking, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go along for another 10 or 15 years. So I think the question, uh, just to uh, clarify, your question was the symptom you have where you have a, sounds like you pause in your breathing for 45 seconds. Is that related to asthma or could it be something else? I couldn't breathe for a minute. I, I just stopped breathing. Uh, I, it's the only time I remember doing so. I might have done it once before that. I'm, I don't remember doing it once before that. Oh. It was some time ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is I'm that just, while you're, I mean, I'm, you're awake and trying to breathe, but you just couldn't get air in? Is that well, right? I, it wasn't a question of trying. I couldn't try. I couldn't do anything. I just lied there. I was in bed, I think. But you were awake and to breathe again. You were aware, aware that yeah. you couldn't. Okay. It happened once before, but it didn't bother me the first okay. time it happened. It so just bother to me the second time. Separate between whether you're awake and, or sleeping. Yeah, I was awake. Um, so, I mean, it could be asthma or COPD. I'm not sure if you couldn't get air in because your airways were constricted and tight and inflamed. Um, but it doesn't sound like that because if you're able to breathe 45 seconds later and then you're able to breathe okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it sounds that it might be more uh, related to the central nervous system. And, you know, in people who have lung disorders, uh, especially chronic ones, yes. oftentimes the, the level of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the system changes. Yes. It adjusts. 
uh, normally, for example, the carbon dioxide level is about 40 in the system, in your body, in your, in your blood. And when you have a lung disease where it's harder to get air out, that carbon dioxide can rise. So it might go up to, say, 43, 44, and that's okay. I mean, it's not, it's not going to cause any severe changes and dysfunction in the body. But that becomes your new baseline, your new normal. And the brain resets itself to say, okay, 44 is your normal. Um, and if you say you get some kind of spell that causes you to breathe quickly, hyperventilate, that level goes down below 40. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to, to identify when you breathe faster than usual. But if it goes too low, that carbon dioxide goes too low because you're breathing fast, the body tries to compensate by slowing down your breathing. The brain interprets that as, you know, you're breathing too fast, you have, your carbon dioxide is too low now, and there's no drive to breathe. So it actually, you breathe less, and that's just your body trying to compensate and get it back to that normal level of where it was. Where it was. May I say one more thing? I can I can swim in the Pacific for two hours off Waikiki, but I can't run uh, to a bus okay. easily. I'm sorry. You said I, you can. I, I can swim in the Pacific Ocean off Waikiki for two hours, but I can't run to a bus easily. I, I I'm 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 short of breath when I run to catch a bus. I see. But I can swim in the ocean for two hours. Yeah, and I guess uh, it depends on, on the the level of you know, activity, the strenuousness, I mean, yeah. um, how much you're doing when you're swimming versus when you're running, and is that, yeah. you know, really exerting yourself more? Yeah. Um, and I, I have heard that at the around the ocean, people can also breathe better because of the, the moisture in the yeah. air. Yeah. So a lot of people actually will be able to surf or swim um, because of the that salt water, the moisture in the air is easier uh, and better tolerated than, Thank you very um, much. On the air. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all so much for being such an attentive audience. And I'd like to have everyone give Pedro a hand for being our MC. <laughs> and then I'd also like to thank our exhibitors, especially Queens Medical Center, Kaiser Permanente, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, Griffles, CSL Bering, AstraZeneca, and thank you so much for our volunteers, the Kapiolani Community College Respiratory Therapy Program, <laughs> University of Hawaii Hilo College of Pharmacy, University of Hawaii Manoa Pre-Pharmacy Program, <laughs> and then I, if everyone wants to turn their uh, forms in, we'll have lunch, and we also are going to be calling a uh, door prizes over lunch. So hang on to, listen for your name and when your name is announced, you can get a prize. The prize runners will run around. Okay, so we'll pick more prizes. Thank no. you so much. <laughs> Everyone likes to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's hypnotic. Choose some. Choose right. some prize. Can Ralph Antonio hey, Ralph. come up to get his Right. They're, they're going to give it to you. Just raise, your, just raise your hand when your name is called, and they'll bring you a prize. And then the lunch will be served in a moment. Okay, go ahead. Read their cool. name. Ron Puri. Oh. Puri Ficacion. Puri Ficacion. Florentina. Florentina Salvalal. Just raise so. your hand. Pick a prize. Pick a name. <laughs> Is this okay with you? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay, we'll give them some too. Carl uh, Thompson. Yeah, I think this one. Brett Noons. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Alvin Okihiro. Come on. <laughs> Do we have a name? L this year somewhere. That one doesn't have a name. Oh, the wife is still here. 
I guess he's probably Whoa. biology break. Anna N. Oshiro. All right. Mary Lewis. Oh, right back there. Joan Thompson. Joan Thompson. Oh, the couple. They rigged it. Pat Antonio. Oh, my goodness. Is this? I have one. Kitty. Oh, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. Keith Chong. Chang. Is it Keith? <laughs> Leaf. Oh, right there. Signing up. So. Uh, there's one more. Okay, our last winner is Kitty Souza. Oh, great. Those were prizes or not? Yeah. Sure. Four prizes? Oh, but they're walking out already. Should we stop them? Oh, they're gonna get. Yeah, more prizes will be drawn over lunch. Oh. All right. I don't know. I don't know. What are we gonna do? Where's Oh, the students are going to bring you lunch. So lunch will be brought in here. So if you're waiting for lunch, you don't have to go outside. The, the students will come in and bring you lunch. So you can go ahead and stay seated. And the drawing hasn't ended. Oh, we, we still have, oh, yeah, we still have prizes. Are still upstairs. Exhibits are upstairs. Auntie Vicky, you want a prize? <laughs> nah. Auntie Vicky, you want a prize? No, don't give her a prize. <laughs> They kind of mixed them up. That's okay. It's all right. Joe Chan. Where'd they go? All the way in the back. The students are oh, all going to help Chan get is the back food. There. Joe is still here. Okay. All right. You all go. right, Pedro. Monica Hamada. Put her on the side. Might be a student. Okay, these are, I'm going to put the ones that didn't show up. Yeah, might be students. That's why. Gerard Tyra. Who? I don't know. Put it on the side. Might be a student. Carol Yoni Yama. Sandra Bike or Bake. Oh well, maybe stop. We, we just, just serve lunch. lunch. Yeah, just serve lunch. That's okay. We're just going to serve lunch. Okay, that's good. We're good. No, we, we, we were out of those. We gave those up. Okay, I think we're serving lunch. So people have to have their pink form filled out front and back and then hold it up and the students will give you a lunch. Yeah, yeah, you should. You should talk to him. That's good.